Okay, so the power of a point with respect to a circle, okay, so, so it's essentially you just take any straight line and that intersects the circle in two points, P, A and B. So you, you take the quantity, which is the directed product of PA and PB as directed line segments. <coughs> okay, so this gives you a quantity which is positive if P is outside the circle, it's negative if inside the circle. Uh, if, it's, if P is on the circle, it's exactly zero. <coughs> Fine, and uh, there, there are other ways of approaching the thing. Of course, if the point P is outside the circle, you can easily see taking the point uh, in the limiting position where it is tangent to the circle is the square of the length of the tangent line segment tangent to the circle. Uh, well, of course, this can't be done if the point P is inside P. Yet, it gives rise to a formula. Of course, the length of, uh, length of the line segment, which is tangent to the circle, uh, can be computed easily as the square of the distance of the point P to the center and, of course, R squared. Well, this formula, although I have shown it to you, shown, shown it for a point outside the circle, retains its validity even if P is inside the circle. Well, that's because, for instance, if P is inside the circle, then you choose the straight line in any way that you like through P. Well, you choose, since, it's, since, it's, since you are free to choose, you choose it to be the diameter through P, which tells you that, of course, the length PA and PB are respectively PO minus R, PO plus R as directed quantities if you wish. Uh, I mean, well, uh, well, so, so that I've chosen them so that they have got different signs. So you've got the same formula. So we have these formulae. Okay, so, so that's, that's the power of a point with respect to a circle. Now with this, you've got this rather interesting concept of the radical axis. So what happens is, uh, the, if, if you take two circles, not one circle, but two circles, and uh, then you can look at the set of points, uh, set of points which have the same power with respect to the two circles, and of, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing that so, so this, that set is just a straight line. Okay, so given, uh, uh, given, let me, Put a blank here, circles, uh, uh, let's say alpha, beta. The set of, the set of uh, points with equal powers. With respect to alpha beta is a straight line, is a line. Well, I shall, I, shall, I shall qualify this line a little bit further down. And why is that? Well, the answer is quite simple. Observe the blank. I'm making a, I'm making a, I'm making a simple, slight, yet deliberate mistake. So that's your alpha, let's say the circle, let's say the center O, and then, well, for purpose of illustration, let me take a quite dissociated circle beta, let's say with center O prime, let's say. And uh, when and how does a point P have the same power with respect to, with respect to these two circles? Well, let's say if this, is, this has got radius big R and this has got R prime, then uh, this happens if and only if, if the, okay, so, so this, the, the, the power with respect to beta is PO prime, of course, squared minus R squared. This will be equal to PO. That is this, that's the power with respect to, I'm sorry, R prime squared minus R squared. Well, that is, okay, so, so, so if you do that. Now, I mean, a very simple application of the theorem of, okay, so, so that means, so that means if you take the difference between PO prime squared and PO squared, well, that is, uh, that is uh, uh, of course, equal to, equal to R prime squared minus R squared, which is, of course, a constant. Which is, of course, a constant. Well, the squares of the distances, the, distance, the difference between the squares of distances is equal to a constant. Well, you can easily show that, show that then 
if you drop a perpendicular from the point P to the line OO prime, so let's say, let's call it PA, P perpendicular, the, you can check that if this, this happens, if and only if P perpendicular occupies a fixed position. So it's uh, fixed. This fixed on the line OO prime, and in fact, and in fact, so the so the so the points, so the points which have the same power with respect to the circle, these two circles, is in fact a straight line. It is in fact exactly the line that is perpendicular to the straight line OO prime at the point PP perpendicular. Okay, so that's that's a straight line. Well, well we have found in fact that we have found in fact that this line is in fact is line is okay. So two remarks I have to make. This is a line which is perpendicular to the line of centers, line joining centers. This will be important, the centers. So that's one thing that is to be noticed. The second thing is that in order for, in order for this whole construction to go through, you must, you must make the condition that the points O, O prime are different. If, if O and O prime coincide, then this kind of thing doesn't work. In fact, in fact, if you have got a single point O in which O prime also resides, and if you have got two circles with that center, then, well, if the circles are different, then no point can have the same power with respect to these two circles. It's impossible. So the set is empty. If you have the same point O, o prime, Okay, so two points are coinc two centers are coincident, and if the circles coincide too, so if this is alpha equals beta, then all points have the same power with respect to the circle. So that's another trivial situation. So to, to exclude those trivial situations, let's say given non-concentric. So two circles. Two circles which do not have the same center. Two circles whereof the centers do not coincide have this property. So the set of points, which was, uh, such that the, 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 the set of points with equal power with respect to, the, to both circles is a straight line. Now that's interesting. Okay, so check that the terminology. This red line is called the radical axis. Radical axis. Radical axis, radical axis of the circles alpha, beta. Okay, so that, that, that that's once again, once again. I mean, uh, like all things connected with the concept of uh, power of a circle, uh, this is an this is an I mean this is an unexpectedly charged concept. Along along this the presence of this presence of such a straight line will actually allow us to, to draw very important conclusions. And of course, you will have a nice number of problems in your problem sheets, very amusing things. So that's radical axis. There is yet a third thing which I wish to mention. Uh, let's say, okay, so, so that's what happens with two circles. So given two circles, non-concentric, the centers do not coincide, then you can construct actually a straight line on which, on which the points with equal power reside. They live there, okay, so that's exactly. And uh, you, ca you can do something similar with three circles. Okay, so given three circles, I would like to leave a blank here. Alpha, beta, gamma. Uh, there is a point. Unique point which has the same power. Power with respect to all three circles, with respect to <coughs> alpha, beta, gamma. Now, how is that? Well, the idea is very simple, and in fact, we have gone through arguments of this kind uh, several times, of course, in different contexts, but the argument is the same. So you've got your alpha, 
of one circle. You've got another one, beta. And you've got yet another one, gamma, the three circles. Uh, what you do is, of course, what you notice first is that the set, of, so you would like to, you would like to find a point which has got the same power which is with respect to all these three circles. Now, of course, you start by looking at the set of points which have the same power with respect to alpha and beta. Well, that will occupy, of course, a straight line which will be perpendicular to the line joining. Okay, so let's call that, uh, let's call that, um, now, I don't like this. I don't like this. So let me call this alpha. Let me call this beta and gamma. So let's call this straight line K. So the, the, the straight line that consists exactly of those points which have the same power with respect to beta and, beta and gamma. Okay, now, so, so that, that's a good place to start with. I mean, if you have got a point which has the same power with respect to three circles, then it must live on the straight line. Um, and then, then look at, look at gamma and alpha. Well, you know that, you know that there is the set of points which have the same power with respect to gamma and alpha. Well, they live on a straight line, the radical axis of gamma and alpha. Which is perpendicular to which is perpendicular to the the line that joins the centers of gamma and alpha. So let's call this straight line L. Well, K and L will intersect. So stop for one moment. Stop for one for one moment and ask yourself, will they? But let's say they they intersect in a point. Well, that point you see. Now that's 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 my picture is a little unfortunate. My picture is a little unfortunate, so let me let me take the circle a little bit away. Okay, right. So this point, uh, the this the point in which K and L intersect will have the same power with respect to beta and gamma, and observe with respect to gamma and alpha. So that means the point which is both on K and L must have the same power with respect to beta and gamma and alpha. And of course, you come to the conclusion that if you if you look at the look at the set of set of points which have the same power with respect to alpha and beta, which will of course be a straight line joining these centers of alpha and beta, that must go through the very same point, the very same point. Okay, so that's there is a point which has got the same power with respect to. <coughs> <coughs> the three circles, alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, so that's, and that's the terminology. This, this thing is called the radical center. Radical center of, of course, alpha, beta, and gamma. Right, now what about the blank here? So what's the deliberate mistake that I have made? Of course, what can happen is of course that uh, of course, the, the crux, the crucial point in this argument is that the straight lines K, which is the radical axis of gamma and beta, and the straight line L, which is the radical axis of gamma and alpha, that they intersect. Uh, I have assumed that. What if they do not intersect? Well, in Euclidean geometry, your lines can be parallel. So how can, how can K and L be parallel? Of course they can be parallel if your alpha is like this, beta is like this, and gamma is like this, so that the three centers lie on a straight line. So that, for instance, the radical axis is K is like this, and the radical axis L is like that. So that kind of situation we would like to avoid. We would like to preclude that kind of, <coughs> that possibility. So the blank should be filled with, given, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's, that's, that's circles of it, with non-collinear centers. So the centers, okay, so the centers shall not be collinear, so they will be like this. So the centers of the three circles should not lie on a single line. Otherwise, otherwise it makes no sense. I mean, you must, I mean, of course, 
of course you can you can push on and you can for instance say things like well if my three circles have their centers on a straight line then the radical center is away at infinity well that can be done but you must be careful what kind of what kind of infinity you are talking about what kind of geometry you are talking about that is a that is a that's a rather interesting situation fine 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 good okay so that's radical center and uh, the, the, the this this is such a such a such a simple and in its simplicity such a powerful powerful concept that it can be it can be employed in all kinds of contexts giving you really surprising really very elegant results and well here is the thing uh, i mean i've spent a lot of time doing geometry i mean since, since my youth but you know there are all sorts of interesting results lying around which you do not notice it, or only in, only in my uh, at, at, at a very advanced age i learned the following theorem which is an extraordinarily elegant, if a little contrived, if a little convoluted proof of a, of a, of a, of a result which, which can be considered as the dual of Pascal's theorem on conic sections. It's a result, okay, so, and, and I, I, shall, I, shall, I, shall, I shall prove it, I shall prove it by using the concept of radical center, the concept of radical center, and but by the way, I have learned this proof from the book, the recommended book by, by uh, Coxter and Greitzer. You know, I, I, I told you, it's, 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 a, it's a most beautiful book, it's, it's a bedtime reading book. Okay, so I've learned it from that, that very small, that small, uh, small humble book. Uh, it's, a, it's a most interesting result. It's a result which is, as I say, it's a dual of Pappus theorem, and it is usually ascribed to a mathematician about whom I know very little. In fact, I don't even know how to correctly pronounce, in fact, correctly spell his name, but there it is, theorem. Okay, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's usually referred to a mathematician. Well, Rianchon, apparently. I, I'm not quite sure even about the sm uh, spelling. It's very little, very little. I, I know very little about the person, so perhaps I shall learn in the future. It it's can be understood as a kind of dual of Pascal's theorem. Okay, so do you remember, do you remember the Pascal theorem? So it was, if you take a, take a conic section, and if you've got six points, let's say A, B, C, let's say A prime, B prime, C prime on it, and if you join B C prime, B prime C, and obtain X, C prime A, C A prime, obtain Y, B prime A, B A prime, and obtain Z. So X, Y, and Z are collinear. That was that was Pascal's theorem. Now the dual. Of course, we have not defined duality. We have not made a thorough and complete. Uh, study of duality, but I appeal, I appeal to your intuition, and uh, the result is as follows. The Briancion theorem says that if you take a conic section, okay, so I'm not going to write down, I'm not going to write down a statement because, you know, it's just too long, and I think uh, we, we just should occupy ourselves with the beauty of the thing. So if you take a conic section, so I, I, I'm taking it, you know, as a rather X-shaped sort of thing, an ellipse, let's say. And if you, so instead of, instead of points, you have to take lines. So instead of points on the conic section, you will take lines tangent to the conic section. So let's say uh, you take line parallel to this A. Well, let's, let's, so, okay, so. So let me do it like this. So this is, let this be A, let this be A prime, and then, well, this, this okay, so A, yeah, A, okay, so B. So it's, it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a thing that's difficult to get right. So I apologize before, A, B, C, A, B, C. So just as I take points A, B, C on the, conic section, 
In this case, I take three lines tangent to the conic section ABC and another, another triple A prime, B prime, C prime. So, so let's say perhaps, perhaps something like this. That's C prime, A prime, C prime, let's say B prime. Okay, so in this case, what we did was to construct the to construct the construct B prime C B C prime the lines. So in this case, for instance, I take I take B prime C. That's a point intersect the lines B prime and C, and then and then I let I let the points I let the line B and C prime intersect, and uh, so I, I obtain a point, yet another point. And uh, so just as I constructed the lines in this case, in the case of the Pascal theorem, B prime C and B C prime, and let them intersect in X. So I take the straight line joining these two points, and I call it the straight line X. So capital X is replaced by lowercase x. So to indicate that it's lowercase, I'm Sort of, uh, I'm I'm deliberately writing it in uh, in in, uh, uh, in handwriting. Okay, and then and then and then and then let's say okay. So C C C A prime. Uh, okay, C A prime. Okay, C and A prime intersect in here. C prime and A intersect in here. And if I join these two straight lines like this, and let's call it the straight line Y. Okay, and finally, and as I say, and finally, this, so, well, I, I'm sorry, this, 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 this is really, this is really, this is really not a very good picture. Okay, so, so let, me, let me make it slightly like this, okay. Okay, uh, and then finally, and then finally, and then finally, of course, and then finally, so I've got this, uh, what's this? That's, that's B prime, right. Okay, so, uh, okay, so what else? Okay, yeah, uh, B A prime, finally, B A prime, and the and B prime A, so like this. Okay, so I join these two by a straight line. Well, I'm sorry, as you can see, I'm sort of exaggerating the thing. I have to, and that's the straight line. So the straight lines x, y, and z have to have to go through the same point. Have to be concurrent, and of course, it's possible that they are parallel. Well, well, uh, of course, the thing didn't come out very nicely because what I drew possibly was not a good conic section. It's it's just an x-shaped curve. Besides, possibly. The, my tangent lines were not quite accurately tangent. So anyhow, that's, that's the Briançon's theorem. It is uh, what you might call a dual of Pascal's result. Now, how are you going to prove this? Well, once again, as, as it happened with the Pascal theorem, the proof will be done, the proof will be done, proof will be done uh, for, a, for a, not for a general conic section, but, <coughs> but for, Chivermain, uh, Chivermain, Chivermain. Uh, just, uh, but for Seskai de Geliyom düzgün. Because şu, bir, bir, sürü, bir sürü şeylerle oynadım çünkü. Okay. Geliyor mu ses? Okay. Right. Uh, so I, I will, I will prove the thing not for a general conic section, but I shall prove it for a circle. As I said, this is a, this is a beautiful. If somewhat, if somewhat artificial proof, and I have learned it from Coxter and Greitzer's problem. So instead of this conic section, okay, so instead of the conic section, uh, I shall take a circle. I shall take a circle. So that this, this, is a, this is a picture which is rather, rather difficult to produce on the blackboard. And uh, yeah, okay, so, so, so I've got, so I've got, let's say for instance, the straight lines, so, let me take them pair by pair. So this is A, this is A prime. Okay, so this is A, this is A prime. Three pairs of, three pairs of straight lines, let's say. And let's say 
B and B prime, let's say, B prime B. Okay, so I'm, 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 I'm being a little meticulous uh, in my, in, so, I, I, so, that, uh, so that I can obtain a good picture, you know, that's, that's, that's not very easy. That's not very easy. It's difficult to, it's difficult to uh, get a situation where your picture is good. And it's actually a very simple idea. It's a very simple idea, but all the same. Okay, so, so, that, so, these, are, so these, are, these are your C and C prime. Okay, so as you can see, I, I've, I've, chosen a, I've chosen a counterclockwise way of designating things A, A prime. Okay, so B, B prime, A, A prime, C, C prime, like that. Okay, fine. The straight lines touch my conic section. Or let me perhaps start with, start with the points in which the, these lines intersect to form the vertices of a, some kind of a hexagon. So this is, let's, let me start with A and let me go and let me go in um, in um, uh, in counterclockwise fashion like that A B, okay. So that's C. So that's uh, D, and that is uh, E, and of course I've got finally F, the point in which the lines C prime and A prime intersect. That's the point. Uh, have I got this right? Uh, just a minute. Yeah. Uh, just, just, one, just one moment, just one moment. Uh, e and C. Uh, the, and, you know, that's the kind of, okay, thing I have to be careful about. Okay, because, yeah, right. Okay, so, uh, and, and then let's get the points in which the tangencies occur, so for instance, B touches the circle, let's say, in, in the point. Okay, so, so let me start elsewhere. Uh, let's say uh, A, why don't I, okay, just, just one moment, just one moment. Uh, B, yeah, B, yeah, okay, so B, so for a C prime, well, Uh, no, I, I want to, yeah, this, this doesn't quite get me what I want. Okay, right, never mind, never mind. Okay, so let this be P, Q, R, S, T, and U, okay. So that's not my original designation, but it, does, it really doesn't matter. Okay, so fine. So what you do, what you do is the following. You choose, you choose uh, circles, you choose circles, let's say, uh, which, like the original circle, touch, let's say, B and B prime. So somewhere here. You choose it in such a fashion, now that's, 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 the, that's the artificial part of the proof. You choose it in such a fashion Let's say so it touches the B in, in let's say, in, let's say, uh, yeah, uh, P prime and in R, R prime. So, of course, the straight, the line segments P, P prime and R, R prime are, have the, are of equal length. So that's one thing. And, and, then, and then what you do, having, having found this, having decided upon this length, it can be anything really, it's arbitrary. Then you go on, okay, so let's call this circle beta. You go and choose a circle which touches A and A prime. So let's call this alpha in exactly the same fashion. For instance, let's say, okay, so it touches A in, uh, let's say, Q prime, Q, Q prime, and uh, A prime in T prime, so that, so that the length Q, Q prime and T, T prime are the same. As P, P prime, or R prime. So this is obviously something that you can do. Well, although my picture has not turned out to be very well, so very nice. So, so you can do the same thing here. So you can take a circle gamma here, so that it touches, it touches the lines C and C prime, let's say in S prime and in U prime, so that 
SS prime, UU prime have the same length as TT prime, QQ prime, PP prime, RR prime. So you've got you've got this you've got this you've got this rather rather nice picture with lots and lots and lots and lots of coincident line segments. Uh, so these are all equal to one another. RR prime uh, equals SS prime. So that can be done. That can be done with no difficulty at all. So it is there. Uh, well, once you have done this, once you have done this, then you look at the following situation. You see, you see the point A, the point A, its power with respect to beta is of course the square of AP prime. And its power with respect to gamma is a u prime, but you see, p p prime, p p prime, and u u prime have the same length. Besides, the line segment a p and a u being the line segments tangent to the same circle and emanating from the same point. <laughs> they are equal in length. So it means that. So it means that the length AP prime AP prime squared is the power of of A with respect to beta. That's AP prime squared. But AP prime squared but this is also equal to AU prime squared. Well, that is the power of, again, the same point, power of A with respect to gamma, with respect to, yeah, gamma in this case. Well, so that means, that means, uh, that means uh, the point A is actually on the radical axis of beta and gamma. So that means A is on the radical axis, Ra, of beta and gamma. Now, look at D. Apply the same argument. The power of D with respect to beta is the square of dr prime. The power of D with respect to gamma is the square of ds prime. I know ss prime and rr prime are equal in length, and so are ds and dr. So it means that d has, and the same thing applies, not only to d, a, but also to d. d is also on the radical axis of beta and gamma. So you've got a very funny, you've got a very funny <coughs> conclusion that the line that joins a and d is in fact, is in fact, is, so da, is the radical axis of beta and gamma. I leave it to you to check that if you join B and E, B E is the radical axis of gamma and alpha. You can do you can exactly the same argument. Finally, CF is the radical axis of alpha and beta. You have got three radical axes of three circles. They intersect in a single point, which is the radical center of alpha, beta, and gamma. That, I think, is, yeah, but that's, that, was, that was fast, wasn't it? Now, yeah, OK. Uh, you may be slightly, you may be slightly disappointed that it's so f it's so fast, so short, but it's true. The only thing is that it is slightly artificial. I mean, the way you use the circle so as to make all these line segments equal to one another, it can be done. It can be done. Once you do it, then the famous point in which the three lines intersect in Branchon's theorem with, of course, in the special case of a circle, turns out to be, turns out to be the radical center of three, three circles. 
Good. Okay, so I shall conclude here with the following remark. We have, we have said that in geometry, two lines may intersect in a point, unless they are parallel, of course. Uh, but if three lines intersect in, a, in the same point, then that is something remarkable. And proving three lines concurrent or parallel, it will always be an important thing. So we have developed methods for proving three straight lines to be concurrent. And of course, the most, most notable among them was the theorem of Seva. Now we have got yet another technique by means of which you can prove three straight lines to be concurrent. That is the technique of power, the te a technique based on the power of a point with respect to a circle. So if you, if you have got three lines, and if you can prove those three lines to be the radical axis of two by two, radical axis of three circles, then those straight lines must go through the same point, which will of course be the radical center of the three circles in question. This is, I think, a very fine example of the technique. In the problem sheets, there will be several other applications. I think